Service League. I served two terms um, last year and the year before that, but Amelia and I are actually um, from the same class year, and since the very first time we heard about the Follies, she and I have been conspiring ways to um, pick all of your brains and learn everything there is to know about the Follies because of the treasure trove that the Junior Service League just put in the repository here at Thomasville History Center that everyone's going to have an opportunity to see. Things like all the programs, things uh, prop drawings, notes, things that the director had to say about cast members. Um, just all of, the delightful things, all of the delightful things that painted such a beautiful picture for us. So we cannot wait to, to get to hear all of your memories and um, hear you share about it. I'm excited to see a couple of Junior Service League active members here as well. Um, they are still doing a Cracker Jack job at supporting 40 youth programs here in Thomasville and still have to do hours. Um, every year, very similar to the way it was structured. Um, I am curious to know how many sustaining Junior Service League or how many Junior Service League past members are here. That is awesome. I would love um, at the end if you ladies will give us just a moment of your time. I would love to get a picture of you with our current members um, for the Junior Service League's archives as well. 
So, um, a little bit about how this evening will go. Ann did a wonderful job at kind of delivering the expectations of the evening as the fact that this is one big open conversation that we're all having together. So our panelists will start the conversation by sharing a memory um, during their involvement in the Follies, and that will open discussion to questions and comments. And um, we would love for you, whenever you do have a question or a comment, if you can stand, please do and say your name. And if you um, would like to talk about the years you were involved or how many years you were involved, that would be very interesting to us and also um, Facebook. So Ephraim and Amelia will be interjecting every now and then with comments and questions that we are getting live from Facebook from people that could not be here and um, otherwise just for fun facts. So I would love to introduce the panelists for tonight. A lot of you know who they are. Um, Dr. Robin Wise was a Follies performer for many years and um, as long as he can remember what's on the shirt tails of the Follies even growing up. Um, um, Dr. Robin Wise. Sorry. And Ezra, if you do not know him, also interjecting. A frustrated dancer. This is Janice Faircloth, Follies performer and past president of the Junior Service League, and a plethora of other phenomenal things. Uh, Mrs. Kathy Cable, Follies performer and past president of Junior Service League. And Fran Milberg, Follies performer and past president of Junior Service League. We would love to open the discussion with Miss Janice Bearcloth. If you could kind of share us a little bit of information about um, your experiences. Um, may I sit? <laughs> um, yes. Tom and I moved. Oh, okay. Good. Wonderful. Tom and I moved um, to Thomas School in the summer of 1965, and um, shortly thereafter, um, Mary Louise Ackerman recruited us to sing with the uh, First Methodist Choir, um, which was uh, performing Messiah for Christmas, and she knew that we had sung before, and um, that ultimately led to, um, it seemed every place we went, people would say, um, well, you are going to be in the Follies. And, um, uh-oh. That kind of also stem, you know, stems the next question I have for you guys about malfunctions on stage. That <laughs> <laughs> happens. Um, so we were looking really looking forward um, to um, doing whatever we, we could do for the Follies. And um, our we participated first in, um, I guess, 1960, January 1966. And um, I don't think we missed one then until um, for 10 or 15 <laughs> years, as Tom says, we got too old. <laughs> Transition. <laughs> I think um, our first, uh, our debut was singing um, with Mary Louise as a trio, Trailers for Sale or Rent, <laughs> <laughs> the old Roger Miller uh, King tune, King of, King of the Road, and we were dressed as hobos, and we danced and pranced and sang, um, but then the bug had bitten, so I think that um, that ultimately that led to um, many more performances. I wanted to say a little something about um, why I think today, if an organization that you were a part of said, we're going to do a fundraiser and it's going to take 30 days, <laughs> um, you would probably say, well, count me out. <laughs> you know, I can't devote that much time to one fundraiser. But I, the feeling was that we would concentrate on raising this money for our budget. Um, we were all in for 30 days. And then the rest of the year, we could concentrate on our real purpose, which was not to give the community a great time uh, and create a, a wonderful social um, atmosphere but um, to um, promote our um, 
child welfare uh, projects, which um, were, were very important to us, and which included um, eye and dental clinics, where we actually went into the schools and checked eyes. Um, we picked up kids who were referred by teachers and took them to for dental appointments. Um, we um, crippled children. We staffed two um, two clinics in conjunction with social services at Archbold. One was the crippled children's clinic. Every other month, um, Dr. Charles Hancock, Chip's dad came down from Scottish Rite, and along with uh, Dr. Adcock, I can't remember his first name, but they saw patients who were um, patients of Scottish Rite um, to, have, to keep these families from having to go to Atlanta when it wasn't absolutely necessary. They would come making uh, the medical care more accessible to them. Um, we did, uh, or Thanksgiving boxes to um, deserving and, and families needy, and uh, did an empty stocking fund, which um, collected uh, all kinds of toys and games and things that could be refurbished. Uh, we partnered with the Thomasville Fire Department, and um, they made old bicycles look brand new, and um, that was very fulfilling too. So we did. Um, and it still probably do, I'm, I'm not up to date, but um, we were busy every month. So it, to, to have a wonderful fundraiser that um, afforded us so much fun and, um, and be able to support uh, our projects for the rest of the year um, was very rewarding. And um, I will, yield and jump back in at a later time is also um, fun fact with the junior service league a lot of the programs that you all pioneered um, especially the eyeglasses for children who would not give them otherwise is still a program that we touch every day so right. that is something that you guys started that is amazing well I moved to Thomasville kicking and screaming <laughs> <laughs> I moved here with my husband in 1971 and I was pregnant with my firstborn my in-laws lived in Cairo. <laughs> we came here, it was January, and it was dark, and it was, I was miserable. And I would pick up the newspaper, and there would be a blurb about the follies going on. The editor would write little notes about the follies, and guess who's in the follies this year, and guess who's going to do a show, a number this year. But when the Follies was over, the editorial turned nasty. The people who had been in the Follies, who had worked themselves to death, did not realize that they were insulting somebody else in town, maybe. We were going on a script, and we knew what we were doing was not highbrow. <laughs> but that year, that, that year, and I can't even remember his name, the superintendent of schools oh, oh, showed up on the stage in a diaper. Oh. <laughs> if I tell you the Times Enterprise wrote about it for 30 days, <laughs> and I kept thinking, look at this town. I'm going to. This really was a highlight for me. <laughs> so the, the, it was an interesting year for politics in Thomasville. My background is that my mother studied theater and she wanted to be an actress. Of course, her parents would never let her act. Have you seen The Amazing Mrs. Myself? Oh, that yes. is my mother. <laughs> We saw every Broadway show there was to see, living right outside of New York City. My mother insisted upon it. So I ended up to be a drama queen. No. I could be a princess for go, and drama was my middle name. When I moved to Thomasville in May of 1971, I noticed that people were still talking about the Follies. <laughs> From that year forward, as soon as I had had Scott, 
I started participating in the Follies. I don't even know if I was in the league yet, but I was participating in the Follies. And I see many people out there that I have kicked with, that I have run across the stage with, and Mary Lou Marocca and Donna Harvard and myself were the stars one year. <laughs> and you know, it was very easy to walk across that stage with Bobby Dollar on the drums. Because he did a roll on that drum, and you shook your shoulders, and you knew you were making an impression on the world. <laughs> well, during, I participated every year for a couple of reasons. The first reason was, it was always practice in January. Now, all of you know, Thomasville is a very social community. And you socialize the whole month of December. And then you dry out the whole month of December. <laughs> it's dark. My husband, CPA, was working. I had a child that I was responsible for day and night, and more than eager to pay a babysitter to go out to the father. <laughs> so it solved all the winter blahs. And many people, I'm sure, had the same problem. And again, I was a drama queen. That year that Mary Lou and Donna and I were the streetwalkers in red sequins from head to toe. There's a picture of us on the oh, back. Oh, is there a picture on the back? Well, be sure to look at it. We were gorgeous. <laughs> I found out that I was pregnant with my second child. Now, that was like... That was 1976. So in 71, I had Scott, and you can tell it took me a while to have a second. <laughs> and I was to be picked up during one of the dance numbers and thrown up in the air <laughs> to be caught. <laughs> now, I never had been slinky. <laughs> I've always been more than willing to say, you know, I come from a family of, you know, schvelt women. <laughs> so I went to the director and I said, I can't be thrown in the air. And he said to me, you can't be thrown in the air. And I said, I just found out I'm pregnant. It's taken me five years to get pregnant. If I get thrown in the air and the guy doesn't catch me, I would hate to tell you what my husband will do to you. So he changed the dance numbers. And maybe Mary Lou and Donna got thrown in the air, but I never got thrown in the air. It was a wonderful time of our lives. We were young and we enjoyed every bit of it. And every one of you out there that participated had to enjoy it also. It said that the directors, when they left, some of the junior service league members were following him out of town. <laughs> they were not seeing him to the door. They were literally following him. They had spent 30 days with these people and they felt like he was family, even though he was pure drama and moved on to the next show. <laughs> With that, I'm going to move on my microphone to Kathy. Now, 10 years later, she came in 71. I arrived in 81. A, a young little uh, wife, uh, my husband and I had just finished graduate school in Athens. And I came here, and Jim's first job out of uh, graduate school was with the school system. One of the first questions Milton Callaway asked Jim was, you're not going to be in Follies. <laughs> it was because he lost his job. He lost his job. Yeah, so we got that memo early on. Um, so I was a teacher, a fifth grade teacher, and yes, she was in my class. Scott. Scott. Her <laughs> Scott. And, she had had. and not to mention a, a lot of other wonderful children of my friends in the audience. And so they were so sweet and so inclusive and friendly to me and invited me to the kickoff party in January. And um, I had also met the Wise family. <coughs> Uh, we, we came, and um, uh, I, I have no children yet, but Robin was my first partner ever um, in, right. in the um, 
the production that year. And a great dancer she was. <laughs> uh, uh, but but my my um, family is very musical. Everyone except for me. I don't <laughs> sing. I can't carry a tune, and I don't. I'm not musical in any way. And so the the first the my first memory is of uh, I can't remember his name. You, you think you'll never forget their names. But um, he said, I want everybody, we had to back up to the back of the stage, and he said, I want you to, when the curtain comes up, I want you all to dance forward and, and sing out as loud as you can. And even if you can't sing, sing out as loud as you can. Well, that would be me. And Robin was next to me, my partner. We were coming out, and he looked at me and said, what key are you in? <laughs> Year I became a provisional, and that would be in '83, uh, and I was pregnant with my first child. That seemed to be the way of it um, for a lot of us, and uh, so. And then the year that I was president was uh, I accepted uh, the job in um, May of '87, uh, and realized, found out that summer I was pregnant mm -hmm. with uh, my second child. So. Uh, I was due on February 20th, the first night of Father's Day, um, and I was very large. I had a, I, I was big, short, big, pregnant woman, and it was, it was the, uh, the custom for the president to get up on stage and welcome the crowd. I did it the first night. And then I just begged off the next night. I do remember that. I asked the uh, penny dollar was the, the, the vice president that year, and she did that for me. But um, again, it was absolutely six of the best years ever. Um, I met some friends I still have. I mean, every, every, every one was, it, we had so much fun. My, my mother and my mother-in-law would, would, argue over who was going to come for those three weeks um, for the, the practice weeks. And um, so it, it, it was a lot of fun. And the year that I was just talking to these ladies, the year that I was president, I think that we raised from the Follies between twelve dollars and $14,000. So it, it yeah. came a long way from the original 4700 I think, that we talked about. A while ago, and uh, we were very proud of ourselves. But we were my year, that '88 year, I think, was one of the last years of Follies. Not the last, but one one of them. So we had other projects after that. Um, contrary, contrary to what many of my friends. Say particularly Rick Ivey. Uh, the Follies did start before I was born. <laughs> My mother came back to Thomasville in 1947, I think, from college. Is that right, Mother? That's right. No. <laughs> She's sitting in the back back there. And uh, I came along in 1950. And so I remember a lot about the Follies from the childhood side, um, women didn't work full time like they do today. M many women didn't. Some, of course, did. There were teachers, there were nurses, but a lot of women were stay at home moms, and these were the members of the Junior Service League, and they could devote the time to it. And uh, the women would rehearse during the day for the, the numbers that just involved women. And then when the husbands got off work at night, uh, the, the couple's numbers would be rehearsed uh, in the evening at the auditorium. And it was, uh, as youngsters, my sister and I would go, uh, you know, either after school, mother would take us up there in the auditorium to sit and watch uh, the rehearsals. And sometimes even she would let us go at night for a little while to watch the rehearsals uh, at night. Uh, but we spent a lot of time with my grandparents during Polly's month because uh, they, mother and daddy, were both tied up with rehearsals and uh, 
all that went with that. Um, the cargo company did uh, did a great job. They furnished all of the costumes. They they sent the music down, the scripts, um, the director, and uh, it was a, an all inclusive deal. And they would have a kickoff party. Uh, usually, the ones I remember were at the old Elks Club, and it may have been at the American Legion home also. I don't know, but there, there was a kickoff party to meet the director, hear the run of the show, and uh, the the. League members would have given him heads up as to who could sing and who couldn't sing and who were the funny people that would do the comedy skets, sketches and such as that. And then rehearsals would start uh, in uh, you know early January. This is uh, talking about being a great month of January. It did it did help pass the winter blues. I hate winter time, and when I was old enough to be in the Follies, it was a great diversion for. For January, but um, it was a musical comedy review, a lot of Broadway songs. All of you remember that, the, the dancing and the, and the comedy skits. Um, one thing that I remember from childhood, Neil's, I think it was Neil's, usually sponsored a fashion show. And that was terribly boring for me as a youngster. To have, you know, all the music and all the, and then they gonna have women come out there. And, but particularly Harriet Feinberg, who was they had pictures up here. Just a gorgeous, gracious lady that was a model from the beginning. And Ann Turner, I remember her modeling. Um, and I, I suppose other lady shops here, the Monash shop, Friedlanders. Um, uh, Steyrman's may have, but I, Neil's was a big sponsor of the fashion show part of it. It ran for about 10 or 15 minutes and then uh, went on with the rest of the show. Um, Doris and Osco Hughes provided the music. She did the rehearsal accompaniment and uh, his combo would play for the show. Unbelievably talented people. I mean, you all know them and, and know their son Raymond who is uh, a chip off the old block from, from, from his parents. Uh, Mary Louise Rose Ackerman also helped some with the accompaniment. Um, there, the, um, one of the directors that was here back when I was a youngster, his name was Tom Stokes. And Tom fell in love with Thomasville. And he ended up, he went back to New York or wherever at first, but he ended up moving to Thomasville and lived here and I think passed away here, but he and Ann Turner did a, a live daytime show on WCTV called Meet the Neighbors. And they would bring locals in and talk, you know, it was a great time. And it was a, when live TV originated here in Thomasville. But Tom Stokes, he said, I, I'm here in Thomasville and I love it, I'm gonna stay. Uh, around 1960, I don't know, mid 60s, they began inviting the the seniors from high school to participate. And uh, that was just a great kick for the, you know, when you got to be a senior, you knew you could go be in the Follies. And uh, so in 68, I guess, I was a senior. And that was the first show I think I participated in, other than being a child model in the fashion show when I was about four. <laughs> but I didn't count that. Uh, but the, the, you know, the, they had a cabaret party after the show, and it was just great fun. You had, uh, uh, you know, the, the adults were all having adult beverages and having a great time. And I suppose some people snuck out and got drank beer or something. I don't know about that. For sure. but from the from the old days, I'm going to just name these names just popped into my head, and I know any time you do that, you're leaving somebody out that you shouldn't have, and you all can help me with the list, but. I remember Jim Pettigrew uh, forever being in the Follies. When I was a child, as well as when I was an adult, being in the Follies. Uh, ben Grace, Betty Williams, just the funniest lady you could ever imagine. Margaret Turner, another great gal who was, did all kinds of comedy stuff. Ken Lanter was in it all the time. Dr. Bill Stuckey, uh, Bob Wise, my dad was in about the first 10 or 15 shows. Herschel Clay. Uh, John's mother, Gladys Wilson, was in it for there in a day. I put a picture back on the table of Gladys in her Follies outfit. Uh, check that out before you leave. Mildred Van, Marie Bracy, Betty Lou Bracy, Billy Rigsby just, just did an outstanding job. Margaret Mott. Um, I came back in 76 and, and was in a number of, I guess, the shows until it ended. 
uh, it was just a wonderful time. And I hear, um, I hear a lot of people today say, gosh, I wish they would bring back the Follies. But as you alluded to, it would never happen today. Uh, the, the 20 and 30 year olds, that's just not their thing. They, they can't devote 30 days to rehearse for something like that. And I understand it's different times today, but it sure was a good time when we were, when we were involved in it. You can tell the uh, baby boomer, we take notes on scratch pads instead of, <laughs> I do have an iPad, but I still write it on paper. Uh, a lot of relations started at the Follies. <laughs> yes, uh, Pat Kelly raising her hand. But unfortunately, a lot ended at the Follies. So many of the Follies. And we won't go into any details there. <laughs> um, but it was a great time. It really was fun. I think it was for a worthy cause. It raised lots of money for, you know, they call it the Crippled Children's Clinic back then. But that's probably not very... PC today, but but uh, it, it really did do a lot for this community and still does today. They moved into um, the Bargain Bazaar, something that they could do a lot easier. May she rest in peace. May she rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's spoken like it. That's a remember when for another day. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But anyway, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and if anybody has questions or would like to add anything to anything that any of us has said, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, so I actually thank you guys all for sharing some of your stories. Um, we would love um, from everyone here, and Amelia's going to pass this around. If you have any interesting stories to share about interactions with these um, directors that we've read so many notes about, um, we would love to hear those stories or anything that you would like to add to the conversation that's been had so far. Anybody have a favorite mishap on stage they'd like to recount for everyone? I'd like to add one more thing. Of course. Yeah. You know, the director did come with the script and the costumes and he picked out people to do it. But there was a whole section of junior service league people who did the scenery, the staging, and the lighting. So you're saying you I look at I look <laughs> out at Jean Stone who did scenery for her. 15 years if she did it for a day and you in know cold buildings yes, I mean we yeah. always we, had to we did it at the McIntyre we did it at um, the insurance company owned the corner house an old historic house that has since been torn down and gone um, and we did scenery in that building freezing cold keep in mind January or early February just like now and we cut up refrigerator boxes and put them out on the stage. It was it was a major, major production. And then there was the committee that had to alter the uh, costumes. Right. And so the costumes would come in and after everybody had been assigned their, their uh, act or whatever, then you had to have your costumes Fitted. Uh, fitted and everything so there was a, a committee for that and those poor people had to <laughs> let out seams and take in the seams and, and then they were also there was a committee a quick change committee yes and whether that was the i don't know if that was a wardrobe committee or not but i just remember one service league member having to make sure that uh, somebody came off the stage and was not in the very next um, number. act, but my, number, but, but the, the next one. And her job was to get the pants off the guy <laughs> and to put the next pair on. And he was supposed to have worn, you know, something <laughs> <up>. <laughs> and She was literally squatting down. <laughs> Uh, Janet Lyles actually just wanted to remind everybody about the time that Jim Dukes was in a box and the guys put a concrete block on top of the box and he couldn't get out. <laughs> Fantastic. I 
can't say enough about Jim Lan um, Ken Lan. Yeah. 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 He did yeah. an amazing yeah. job. I yeah. mean, he, he did the lighting every day. They would ask him to do almost the impossible, and he could do it. Yeah. Well. He, he, he was wonderful. He knew that auditorium, you know, from front to back, yeah. back to bottom. Um, he had he crawled did. around that entire auditorium, running wire. Uh -huh doing whatever he could do to make it look right. It did look like a major, major production. And then he left Mark and McFollies and worked for the Music and Drama Troupe all those years. Yeah. Well, and I want you to know that when those costumes were taken off, they were packed in these trunks. Yes. And can you imagine, when we got the trunks, the costumes had been packed for the show before. That's awful. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you, too, that my daughter Whitney was uh, maybe three years old, I'm going to guess, uh, the year that she was going to draw the name of the winning ticket for some giveaway. Yeah. And Robin was on stage with her. And she was so scared to go and do that. But, and she was a tiny little thing, but he asked her her name and she found her voice and <laughs> spoke, you know, and she drew the winning ticket that year. I think that must have been about 76. Yeah. Oh, no. oh, good job. Thank you very much. <laughs> Memories. Uh, Do you have something to add? Well, awesome. I'm Mary Lou Maroka. I'm also a past president. And featured in a red sequin outfit. And, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that was we moved to Thomasville in 66, and <clears throat> my dear friend Pat Davis lived down the street from me, and she wanted me to come watch the Follies, and so I watched it one time, and that was it. I was in oh. probably 15 of them after that, but the first Sopalis I saw, I'll never forget Ben Grace. He was up on the stage. This is a, maybe a little risque, but it was said in the Follies. One of his jokes was somebody said to him, whatever happened to Helena Rubenstein? And he said, Max Factor. <laughs> I was a member of the Exotics, I think. We were the Exotics? Called. We were called the Exotics. I was a member of the Three Stooges, which was Ron Shank and yeah. I. And I don't remember who the third person was, but we were a running gag through the whole thing. But the main thing that was so wonderful was that it was such a fabulous way to meet people. Yeah. South in Indiana, you know, it wasn't just cold in January, it was cold forever. <laughs> but we came down here and it was like coming to a foreign land. Yeah. But anyway, we, we, we just got into the Follies. We, my husband was in it too, and we met so many people that became dear friends and still are, and many have passed on, and it was just wonderful. And I. I remember working in the Crippled Children's Clinic too. Yeah. Also, I I just, it was just a great, it was a great experience for both of us. Right. There's well, one. We, what we were like in the Follies and what we were like in Crippled Children's Clinic are two opposite One thing I meant to also mention about the shows. Uh, that I when I was in them, they always had a sustainers number oh, yeah. when they would oh, let the, the sustaining <laughs> members call or in, beg the sustaining members to come and participate. And I can remember Mildred Van. I don't know. She was probably fifty. I thought she was ancient, but she, was, <laughs> but she would come every year. My mother was in it until her hair turned gray, and uh, it was always a fun number to see them come back and be a part of it because I had remembered them when they were the stars of the show. And one other thing that came out of this is Tosac. Uh, a lot of the people who were in the Follies, when the Follies kind of ended, Tosac had its birth. Um, Ron Shank, who else, Mary Lou? Hugh. Jim. 
but Jim Duke. Jim Duke, that's exactly Duke right. That came out of these people who were who performing in the Follies and were interested in keeping the theater alive in Thomasville. Eddie Lanshank. <laughs> Lane, yes, Ron Emmerling. How neat is that? I did not know that. Does anyone know what year is the absolute end date of the last program that was performed? I don't know. So does anyone in the audience know the exact date? The programs that we have on file end around 88 or 89? 88. 88. 88. Yeah. <coughs> that was the year that I was president. That, that was that last one. Didn't y'all go to a one house one decorating? Decorating. Yeah. 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 We did yeah. the cookbook. Yeah. Too. That's about 88, I think. So it was, I think it, that might have been right. the grand finale. Yeah. One of Our my favorite spring. members, I'm Jess Booth, was, I guess it was 1981, Gary Brook was the director. Gary was about this big and a bunch of us as a going away present got him a step stool so that he could take with him wherever he went so he could be seen. But that was a group of Robin was in that and he and Stanley Five Ash tried to do the who's on the first routine. Oh, yeah. I mean Stanley never learned it. Uh, Robin just, just kept ad libbing as far as he could go. Uh, Steve Kennedy who used to be the city manager, Dusty White, my brother John was Mr. Cellophane and took his clothes off and a kid announced in the bank one day, oh, there's a guy that got naked. <laughs> uh, but we had the doo-wop band where we did uh, uh, Madeline and uh, I've got one of the other, uh, one of the other 50 songs. But, uh, Jody and I, who I was married to at the time, actually went and we followed Gary Brute a month later up to Augusta and uh, got to see him again. But it was, Follies were just a great time. I don't know if anybody, several people here remember this, but Becky Floyd was doing, I don't know if she was doing a walk, she wasn't doing an ad, she was doing something walking across the stage and her vision was impaired. And I don't think it happened during a performance, but I think it was during a rehearsal. She walked right off the stage into her pit. She was not, I don't believe she was hurt, but it scared the stew out of everybody watching. But she just got back up and <laughs> walked around and got, did what she was supposed to do next. But the that was provisionals the, had, that, the provisionals, one of the things they had to do was to walk ads. And of course, that was how we raised money for ads in the bulletin. Yeah. And so there was an art bark who was the R bar for? CNS. CNS. C uh -huh. CNS. Yeah. Okay. And then B Bo the Bear. And this is where scenery also came in. They made the they made the the poster oh, board. Oh, yeah, they were yeah. sandwich boards. But B Bo and R bar, and I always was assigned B Bo. <laughs> yeah. And and we walked around downtown. Uh, yeah. A couple yeah. weeks before the uh, show to advertise with holding signs. Uh, advertising, and then uh, and then we walk across the stage uh, during the show. At some point during the show, so that was uh, how we raised some of the money. We also searched for people. I remember this: we would get go to the newcomers club, and they would give us a list of the the newcomers to Thomasville, and we would get on the phone and call those people and invite them to um, to the kickoff party and invite them to do. Uh, involved in the the follies. Looking at, at Sue here, thinking about those costumes, <laughs> we had the men's dressing room and the ladies' dressing room. And the costumes were always uh, stage right. But they were there for the whole rehearsal. So you went and you got fitted and the costume people were working and working and working, <laughs> constantly working. And then right before the show, everything got moved downstairs to the court. And it was a big production to take all this stuff down. But anyone who wanted to participate, it was a fun thing because we all formed like a line. And, you know, we just did it as fast as we could do it. We got everything down to the courtroom. Basically, the Follies took over the municipal building. And I remember when I was present, we had Coke machines delivered during practice <laughs> so that people could, could get Cokes. And of course, Brenda Palmer was in uh, service league at the time. And um, this was 
But this was a big deal to Thomasville. Yeah. My year as president, which I can't tell you what year that was now because I didn't look it up. Um, <laughs> we we made what did I say? Somewhere between eight or ten thousand dollars. And when you think about how much money that is now, there is not a fundraiser that could touch it. Really, it was pretty special. The participation made it special. But the idea that it was successful motivated everyone to do it again. It was exhausting. How did the audition process go? Did you guys have, so was it open call to everyone in Thomasville? Or was it pretty much? Pretty much. Pretty much. And the wow. director picked it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. But the director was given names. Some heads up. Yeah. yeah. Right. Could have identified yeah. some people in advance. You know, right. But, um, but it was the director's problem. <laughs> yes, That's actually, he could leave yes. it down there. Yes. <laughs> we have um, someone here in the back who wants to share a memory that they have. Well, when I think of the Follies, I really want to salute Emily Searcy. How many remember with Emily Searcy? <laughs> Emily Searcy was the queen of the Follies in the 40s and uh, when it started, and she lived across the street from me, so I just, you know, worshipped her when I saw the Follies, but she would bring me her nosegay each year that she was presented in the Follies. And one year, they had a swing that went out over the audience. Martha remembers it, and uh, Martha lived next door. So we all looked up to um, Emily Searcy, and I just want to salute her tonight because she was such a big part of the early years. And then I don't want to disagree with my handsome dentist up there, but, um, <laughs> but in 1957, um, we high school seniors were cigarette girls. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I forgot that. You know, with the standing. You had a tray. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's what I remember. That's funny. I think that's the bird. Wrote the song Thomasville, yes. and she sat on that swing and sang the song. I didn't Thomasville. Does anybody know the song Thomasville? Mm -hmm. yeah. I learned it in grammar school. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's letting you ready to sing back here. Yeah. <laughs> Give you the sustainers. The sustainers are ready. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was sitting here waiting patiently to hear that. I was very excited that you guys were going to sing to it. <laughs> I have lurks in my office if you want to take a crack at it. <laughs> and thinking about the um, uh, thinking about the walking ads um, and what a great job <coughs> the um, scenery committee did. People were very <coughs> creative and um, made some incredible things that you could we actually wear. For those of you who don't know, I mean, you put your whole body into these things, and one. Um, <laughs> One really great piece was for a commercial bank, and it was a red cash register, and it was a hat, and it was it was probably at least three feet high, all in proportion, um, very realistic, such great detail. And so after walking it during Folly's month or the period of time that they walked. Um, we had someone who wanted to buy the, um, the commercial bank ad, walking ad. And so we sold it and um, she wore it to a contest, we were told, in Highlands and won, <laughs> won the competition. I can only think it must have been a Kentucky Derby party or something, but I can see are wearing this and um, so several years later um, I wanted that cash register for something I don't remember and I called and actually she gave it back to me said she had no use for it so I wound up with it for quite a while and then it the made its way here but I'm not sure um, <laughs> what happened to it but um, they um, these, these ads were very impressive and very much uh, attention getting. If you were a member of the service league, when you, the first year you were a member, you were a provisional, you had to walk the ads. That was part of your provisional year. And um, 
you know, everyone made it out as if it was going to be the worst thing of your life. And it's true that everyone downtown stopped and noticed you. <laughs> but it was, it was great. They got their money's worth. The advertisers got their money's worth. What was the cleanup like after the Follies, after you'd taken over the municipal for 30 days? It, it is really, uh, the costume packing was a big deal. Um, the city did a great job of keeping the auditorium up for us and air conditioned when needed. And, uh, the city was a wonderful, wonderful support during that time. And the fire department, Chief Golden. Yep was wonderful. He was great. And, and I am wise and I was pressed on the I think it was 62. I'm not sure. I just wanted to ask, is there anybody here but me who would admit to being in the first show? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> I was only in the college one time. I was in high school in a little ad they did for Roy Campbell Chevrolet. But I remember the walking ads. And I'll tell you, there were two that really stand out that I still remember. When they were building the new commercial bank across from the auditorium, whoever was, whatever they wore that year, um, the person walked up during the follies and said, we're building new quarters for your dollars. I hope you like the change. So <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, there was a, there was a, <coughs> woman who grew up in Thomasville who was um, very social and um, you might say promiscuous. And she was a walking ad for Thomasville Bedding Company. <laughs> <laughs> sitting in the balcony with all of our friends because the whole town went awesome. with Marilyn Maroka and Rose Chapman and Pat Davis. Mm -hmm. I remember they did you got to have a gimmick from Gypsy yes. as one and I think Pat Davis was the one that turned around and put the trumpet between her knees. No, I did. Was that you? I remember it now. So many, so many great um, so many great Follies memories. It really was a, a fun time to grow up as a kid sitting in the balcony of the auditorium watching those crazy shows. <laughs> that particular number was the only time my father-in-law was ever in Thomasville to see. <laughs> <laughs> um, did the Follies always pack out the house? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Was it always a sellout event? Yeah. 1,500 seats. And that was when it was. And it was multiple was nights. Returning. Yeah. We did a dress rehearsal Thursday night, as Kathy reminded me, that families were invited to come see their parents act like crazies on the stage. <laughs> and uh, then we did a Friday and a Saturday night performance. Wow. And so, uh, you know, it really, I remember Thursday nights lasting forever. <laughs> because we, yeah, we weren't, we weren't good enough to go on Friday. Well, part of the reason for that was um, that proved to be true later with Tosac. We never had a full orchestra until Thursday night. Yeah, right. So everybody that was dancing or singing had their part down pat with the piano. Right. And then the full and orchestra. And then Bobby Dollar came with the drums. Oh, no, that, that's why it lasted so long. Because it was a whole new ball game. Yeah. <laughs> so I did actually have someone that wasn't able to come tonight, but... Um, she shared that she knew whenever the Follies came around that she wouldn't see her mother for three weeks. <laughs> yes. Um, so I guess there were just as many at home as there were in the audience watching you guys yep. with big eyes. Hey, Doc, I remember my son Jonathan yep. and all the other little boys on Washington Street mm -hmm. being so excited about the walking ads. Oh, I love Everything from hard work and whatever it was. And, and they would... <laughs> They would slip out from the YMCA and go uptown just to watch folks walking. Yeah. That was the strangest, most fun thing for them. And, 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 and they would go up and poke at them. <laughs> but, so kids grew up, probably those particularly in your age group, grew, grew up expecting to be a part of the Follies one day. You know, and you said 18? You had to be 18 to be in the Follies? Or well, just a senior. Well, I think it was a senior. When I was there, you had to be a senior. Robin, 
Yes. I think we were allowed our junior year and were senior you? year. Were it you? It's like I did it two years in high school. Could be. My memory's fuzzy. You kids, well, I could be wrong you kids were allowed whenever the director wanted to do a big production number. Yeah. And he needed, needed a bunch voices of and he needed Bodies. people. That might have been what it was. And, and yeah, the director <laughs> called things like that. <laughs> What about, so sustaining members had a, a role and provisional members had a role. So I guess everyone in between just filled out the parts that they could do. And then were husbands of the league always sometimes. in performances? Sometimes. Those sometimes. Not Another superintendents suite. after the ones. Some babysat. Some help build the scenery. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. 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 Ran the spotlights. It was, it was, it was, it was. It was led by the members of the Jew service. Right. I remember um, <clears throat> going home, well, we had day rehearsal, and then I left and went home to fix dinner and turn around and go back, and I was in a big hurry, and I was stopped by the policeman, and I talked him out of a ticket. <laughs> and I told him I, that I had to get to the father. <laughs> Can you would imagine who's in that line? <laughs> Um, Rick. I, I wanted to also mention, I remember my mother-in-law, Nina Falk, who was a junior service league member, said that there were always a lot of babies born in the fall <laughs> as a result of the fun everybody had in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> I have one funny story of my, my husband being babysitting. Um, Scott had a milk allergy, and uh, if you know anything about an enzyme deficiency, which we didn't know back then, everything just ran right for you. And he was babysitting one late afternoon, early evening, and of course, Scott was, you know. And Tom, you probably don't remember this, but you and I were on the stage talking about something, and there were some people rehearsing, and from the back of the auditorium, my husband comes walking in, and he is walking away from him, and Scott is covered from head to toe in... Uh, and who knows? I don't even want to say that. And he said, and Rob came in from the back saying, who knows this child's mother? <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to just... <laughs> I remember Tom, who did not know Rob at the time, oh. kind of looked around like, who is that? <laughs> mentioned the fashion show. I, I remember one of my early uh, memories, my mom worked at Neal's and yes. she worked on the fashion floor and she was early on uh, part of the That's fashion right. show. Yeah. And, and I remember uh, I, I was talking about this uh, you know, at one point in time. They actually got a lot of their uh, clothes uh, from New York oh, and some of the designers in New York and they would bring them down and I must have been a freshman or sophomore in high school yeah. or something like that and I don't know how many of you women remember the, the bubble dress uh, the, the, the dress that the hemline went up under oh, yeah. balloon, balloon, balloon balloon dress yeah. not bubble dress balloon dress yeah. but anyway mom wore one of those uh, and I, I remember she she was telling me that they had uh, gotten some uh, diamond uh, jewelry yeah. for her from one of the big uh, jewelry stores in New York, and they came came down and went, went, and she said it's worth ten thousand dollars, and you can imagine how much it was then. But the only way that she could wear it is they they put it. With the police department yes. at, at the municipal building, yeah, that's where that. they were. And just before she went on stage, she on. She, they brought it up, and there were two policemen that were standing backstage. <laughs> <laughs> they handed her, she put it on, she walked the, the ramp and came back, and they met her there, took it off, and took it back down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Catherine Neal did a great job with that, with the dress shop. He really did. They, they did a. It, it was. It was long too. Yeah. 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 Y
Dude, nobody's going to talk about the uh, trailways bus. I was. <laughs> you want to talk about it? No, 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 no. <laughs> Sometimes the party only got started after we left the auditorium. And um, if we didn't go to someone's home, then um, we would go to the bus station uh, because you could get you could get yeah, breakfast, breakfast, you could get eggs and there was no but you could get those pies. Yeah. And, and you those could... lemon pies. <laughs> <laughs> and the bus station, for those of you who do not know, it was facing Jefferson Street. Yeah. Uh, right at where the library is now. Right, right across from TMB. Immediately yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Which was the Win Dixon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was further down. The Win Dixon was further down. No, 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 no. The bus station was further down on Jefferson Street. Okay. It was on yeah. West Jefferson. Across from the health department. Across yeah, from the health across from the health department. Uh, where the library is. Yeah. <laughs> But, but uh, I mean, they, they didn't have nearly as, as much interest from anybody as they did from the Follies. And, and uh, all of a sudden, they would know during that, during that period of time to have extra, uh, extra stuff to, to fix breakfast and pies and that sort of thing. And I had to get up. I was teaching school, so I would get up and go to school the next morning. <laughs> That's reason she only taught for five years. <laughs> I burned out in a hurry. <laughs> How much were the tickets? Oh, yeah. That's a great question. Oh, good question. I don't know. For some reason, I wanted to say 10 to $12. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And by that, a year, 10 years later, they were 12 15? I, I think so. I think the balcony it was general admission. General, I mean, yeah. It was not reserved. Patrons tickets right. were all the downstairs mm -hmm. and, and they were obviously more expensive. But, uh, yeah. That's about right, I would say. Probably. Never had we never problem. bought them because we were in the show. Right. <laughs> right. How many people were in the programs? Oh. Oh, Lord. Oh. 70, 80. So I was going to yeah. say 75, maybe. Yeah. Uh, That's yeah, it was huge. So the more people you had, warm. the more people would come. Yeah, right. you know, that was the secret. You have somebody in the show, then those people tickets. come to see them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everyone in town <coughs> had somebody in the show. And I asked one of the presidents, do y'all know what percentage? Because you, you couldn't sell but about 3,000 tickets, you know. So. Uh, well, we had the walking ads. Yeah, y'all made a lot of money out of the ads. And we had underwriters the, and program ads. Program ads. And program ads. We sold program. And raffle tickets. tickets. Yeah, the raffle tickets. Yeah. Yeah. We made money any way we could. <laughs> yeah, because that was it. We didn't do anything else. Almost did. And oh, look, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, yeah, another topic for another day. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so you guys have done a phenomenal job at kind of speaking to a lot of the questions that we've all been curious about for years. Um, Amelia, do you have any in particular? Or are there any on Facebook? Any comments or any questions that we've had? Um, you know, there was a couple minor comments. Janet's was really the best, but about uh, someone mentioned that there was actually a committee that they put together to seek out the talent and mm -hmm. uh, recommend names to the directors and things like that. And truth is, there's been about, for us, a live stream, you know, we'll get between three people, five people. There's been basically between 15 and 50 people watching. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Yeah, and, and a lot of them just who had heard about the Follies when they were kids but never got to necessarily experience it and or had moved to Thomasville and heard about it. And uh, a lot of people just really enjoying watching this and that didn't have a chance to get here tonight. So definitely thank you, everybody. Uh, we appreciate it. So we did have someone who was not able to come, um, Jack Pope Jr., anyone remember? So he did send in a letter and he sent in a fun um, picture. You have an opportunity to see it. This will be in the back as well.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of shows. He was in a lot of shows. Well, and he spoke to it a little bit, and I'm just going to read through some of the key points. Um, let's see, with local talent, I was lucky enough to have been picked to portray Uncle Sam singing This Is My Country and God Bless America, and to be in choruses singing Lucky Lindy and Thank You Very Much. I can't remember any uh, everyone in the show's cast, but I do recall Nancy McCollum taking part, along with Bobby Dollar, sparking the band with his drumming mm-hmm. um, that you guys have spoken to. He spoke that it was a wonderful privilege, that took a lot of work and time, was great fun, and it was bound to those involved, um, having a lot in common and being very task and goal oriented um, that you guys have also spoke to, but that most importantly, it was fundraising. And um, yet for us old timers, nothing so far has quite replaced it. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was sweet that I wanted to share as well. Um, does anyone, uh, particularly in the 80s and to the late 80s, mid to late 80s, remember um, if the shows were still just as attended, just as much of a sold out yeah, event? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think for all of all of us, just wondering, <clears throat> I guess, you know, Janice and I have talked about this before at the center, where there was a transition maybe in people's humor, or maybe that it was a transition in people's availability or time or how they, they were willing to share the time. But I guess going into Decorator Show House, right. just was the next. I think all of, some of I it, the town grieved. I, think I can't remember stopped. there being an issue about a lot of the members, when we were in service league, a certain percentage of the members could be workers. Right. The rest had to be you know, available. But I think it was becoming harder to recruit people for the service league because what they were a lot more working. Um, members. So I think that may have had something to do. Do you remember, Randy? I was just saying, it didn't when Cargill went out of business. I uh, thought they closed yeah, up for a while. Closed but Janice says they're still available. They're still different. Uh, I think the league did a great job of quitting the Folly when it was really going down. Yeah. 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 I think the league did a great job of quitting the Folly when it was still very popular. Oh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> it's not like it ran into the ground. No, it didn't it run into the ground. It was an out show. But they moved on. It as there were a lot of factors that. Yeah. that it was a shock to, when. It was a keen disappointment. Yes. Yes. They made the yes. Announcement it, was. it was. It was. It was. But you know, young people are are different now. I think humor um, is more sophisticated, and um, I, I think it's something that would be next to impossible to recreate. You know, but Follies was like was vaudeville. You know, it was slapstick. It was, you know, you couldn't be humble and be up there. <laughs> it was, you know, and that kind of fell out of favor for a while. And so it got harder to get cast members, and it got hard. I mean, harder to get an audience that enjoyed it. Yeah. I think the fact that they quit, like you said, Robin, doing that at the time they did it while everybody was still excited about what was going on and made it easier for the service league to transfer that loyalty to the next project. Yes. Yeah, to the next market. I think that's, um, it, it truly speaks to the program itself, the fact that so many of you are here tonight and so many people are streaming. 15 to 50 is pretty big numbers. Thank you, Ephraim, for those particular. Um, we're just so excited that you all joined us and, and came out, and Anne is going to speak a little bit. I was just going to say, we talk about transitioning. I think the fact that, and I'm not privy all this, the fact that the Junior Service League did do it at the appropriate time goes to a, a nod to their administration of the JSL. Absolutely. Because, like you said, if you let it peter out, it could have, I'm not going to guess, but we might not have had a crowd like you guys here 30, 40 years later, wonderfully reminiscing about it. So that actually is a good testament to how well it's probably run. Good decision making. Absolutely. Or whatever, however that happened. I do remember too that there, uh, the, the idea of the cookbook came up and they had researched how much money we could make on the cookbook. Uh, and, and it was substantially more. Um, I think then then we we would have made and, and the fact that it, it was uh, not such a concentrated uh, time for the project and spread it out over 
more time, and, and I think that had something to do with the tenure. Sure, high percentage work. I mean, 40, 41 years is nothing to sneeze at. That's pretty that's for sure. That's pretty <coughs> impressive. Yeah. I know you. I know you want to mention. There, there's stuff on the back table that people have brought that. You want to encourage people to look through? Absolutely. Um, so show and tell items are on the back table, and while we still have you as a captive audience, uh, on the front uh, case, on your way out of the room, we have information, if you are not already a member of the History Center, about joining the History Center, as well as um, our tours and programs and things like that. And we have all the fun things we do. <laughs> um, and then we have a few different events actually coming up in the next week um, that we hope those that are available will be able to join us for. On Saturday from 10 to noon, we have our drop-in craft time down um, in the Flowers Roberts basement. Bring whatever your, your current project is and enjoy some chit-chat um, with some other folks. And then Saturday afternoon at the Lapham Patterson House, we've got an all-ages drop-in time for folks to make their own Victorian-inspired Valentine free of charge, so it's a fun activity uh, for folks to come in and do. And then next Wednesday evening, we've partnered with the historic Florida Capitol down in Tallahassee. They're offering us a member exclusive, um, basically private tour of their facility, including some wine and cheese pairings. Um, registration is open for that. If you are not already a member, it's a perfect time to join. Um, and we can help you with that. Well, we would love to say thank you to you. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.